Like, why is it that the women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions? Nobody wants to impregnate you if you look like a thumb. We need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian, and I say it proudly. We should be Christian nationalists. Matt Gates is allowed at conferences where teenagers are there. Uh, those weren't statements from your embarrassing uncle on Facebook. I don't really have those. Those are statements from two members of the government's highest legislative body during a National Republican Party conference this weekend, Turning Point. Now, the reason we show you this isn't to prove that these Trump cronies are extremists. You already know that. They're terrible people. But to show you how the things they say actually have real consequences for those who live in their districts, who are subjected to the policies that come from this absolutely evil way of thinking. To talk about that, joining me now, we have Michelle Goldberg, New York Times columnist and MSNBC political analyst, and Sir Michael Singleton, one of the best-dressed guys on TV, political consultant and host of the show Screen Share. Uh, look, I, I, will, I will start with you, Michelle. I'm not a fan of just outrage, right? I, I, you can show me all the terrorists on TV, all the Republicans saying terrible things. It's not new. They've been doing this for most of my lifetime. But what I do think is important is to say that, hey, these people have policy influence. So on that end, do you think that the, the sort of uh, the moderates and the independents in this country, do you think they're really aware of the fact that this isn't just hyperbole now, that Republicans are in position to take some of their craziest fantasies and make them law? Or is it still something that most people are kind of ignoring? I mean, I think it's happened in some sense, you know, how do you go, what is the old saying about how do you go broke suddenly and or slowly and then suddenly, gradually then suddenly? This has been happening for a long time. The subtitle of my first book, which came out in 2006, was The Rise of Christian Nationalism. And when I was talking about this movement and the danger that it might gain political power, I think one of the biggest criticisms was that you're being hyperbolic or that you're being fear mongering. Now we see people who have this ideology that they're version of a kind of malicious muscular Christianity should be imposed on the rest of us, we see those people with real power. So that is the direct line between the Ohio abortion story that we've been talking about or the stories that we're hearing from all over the country of women being denied treatment for miscarriages, for ectopic pregnancies, you know, for pregnancies that have no chance of of, of, of viability, we're seeing already, I think, that the consequences of this Christian nationalist politics is having an effect on people who maybe never really thought that the abortion debate, right. that the abortion debate was germane to their lives. It's remarkable. I'm going to ask about this. Look, I, I know plenty of people who are pro-life, but they're not happy with the Supreme Court decision. I know people who are pro-life and conservative Christians who don't necessarily like the idea of, of, of gay marriages and LGBTQ marriages being invalidated. Do you think those people are a large enough demographic in America uh, or a concerned enough demographic in America that they can be targeted? Or have they already sort of picked a side in these new sort of policy battles and it doesn't make any sense trying to micro-target them anymore? I mean, I guess if you were to ask, are those individuals worth being targeted if they typically vote Republican, I'm not sure, Dr. Johnson, if I would say yes to that question, because for the most part, you're a political scientist, you know this very well, uh, those individuals, although they may not subscribe to those things, they will find other reasons to continue to typically vote Republican, to continue to continue uh, to associate with the conservative movement or party, if you will. Now, as it turns to independent swing <laughs> voters, I do think that there is some potential here to target those individuals, because those folks typically aren't holistically tethered to one side or the other. They may more so like uh, have a preference for some conservative things such as the economy, capitalism, maybe they're strong militarily, but socially they're like, oh, you know, I think some of these folks go too far. I'm open to a different argument. Certainly there are individuals that are independent or swing voters that lean to the left who Democrats would typically just have to figure out a way to turn those individuals out. So I would certainly say it is worth looking at where those voters are, what energizes them, what their interests are, and crafting the message to target them specifically around those issues. Say, yeah, we know you care about these other things, but do you really want to empower this with all of the negativity? I think those voters would be open to that message. I don't, look, 
they may not be full tethers, you know, sort of in the us sense, mm -hmm. but most of them are still voting red, uh, even if they're not in the Absolutely. whole red jumpsuits. Yeah. Um, Michelle, with that in mind, you know, I, I wanted to, to, to point out something about Marjorie Taylor Greene's commentary. It's very interesting to me, and this is also where I think, um, you know, uh, Vice President Harris sort of traveling around the country, going to 800 different places over the course of the year makes a difference. You do have people in these districts who do not agree with these policies. Marjorie Taylor Greene is like, hey, I'm a proud white nationalist. But if you look at the data about her district, her district is 75 percent white, but it's 12 percent Hispanic, 9 percent African-American, 1 percent Asian, 3 percent uh, who, who say they are of two races or more. I mean, there are people in these districts who do not like the fact that they're getting swept along in this white nationalist movement not just from a numbers perspective, but even from a political agitation perspective, can those people be activated? I mean, there have got to be people in parts of Kansas and Texas and Ohio who are like, look, if we could just get a little help or money, we'd overthrow these maniacs because we're not happy with the policies that they're forcing down our throats. Well, I think it's important to say, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene identified herself as a Christian nationalist, which is obviously mm -hmm. a mostly white movement adjacent to white nationalism. But there are also certainly Hispanics who are sympathetic to that movement, um, you know, and we see to some extent um, groups besides white men trending towards the Republican Party because of social issues. I guess the question is when there is a widespread recognition that this party has become so cruel, so far out of the mainstream, so extremist and untethered from most people's ordinary experiences, that there's some sort of revolt. Uh, unfortunately, though, because of gerrymandering and because of the various counter majoritarian elements of our system, you know, just having a majority say, this is not who we are, is not enough. These districts are made in many cases to protect, if not to protect Marjorie Taylor Greene, to insulate right. a lot of these Republicans from accountability. I think that what we're seeing now is the way a party behaves when it knows that it's somewhat protected from Democratic accountability. Sure, Michael, speaking of, uh, sort of lack of democratic functioning in our government, the Senate has been probably the big focus this year. You know, the Democrats are concerned about the Republican organization because they're no longer a party. They're concerned about it. One of the races that, quite frankly, two months ago was totally off the radar was J.D. Vance and Tim Ryan. Most people assume that J.D. Vance, despite all of his sort of issues, was going to just cruise to a victory. Now it looks like he's in trouble. You've got a situation where not only do you have Republicans in the state who are saying, hey, this guy's running the worst campaign we've seen in years, and we used to deal with John Kasich, but also he is being outraised by Tim Ryan, by a significant amount of money. I guess the question is, is there a possibility that Republicans have overplayed their hand with some of these astroturf phony, phony candidates and they may lose seats that they shouldn't lose this fall, despite the fact that they have gerrymandered districts and engaged in amazing voter suppression? I mean, I guess anything is possible, Doc, to answer that question. Uh, what's interesting to me, though, is the transformation of J.D. Vance. I mean, Doc, let's keep in mind, you and I have talked about this years ago, this was a guy who, who wrote uh, the great book, right, describing these Trump voters that we now so that we talk about so frequently today. The gentleman who was on CNN frequently, who was on MSNBC frequently, typically brought on as the quasi expert, if you will, on who these people are, why they think the way they do, their grievance, and why they're so tethered to Trump. Now has done a complete 360, and then you have on the other side Tim Ryan, who by all accounts, as a moderate Democrat, who I actually think can speak to some of those uh, middle-of-the-road Republicans who may be a bit disgruntled, who may be ready to move on from Donald Trump and don't want many Trumps representing their state. And to the point that you raised that question about, can you bring along those disparate coalition groups? I think in order to beat someone like him in a year that may be a best position for Republicans, at least looking at some early generic polling, you have to turn those people out, Doc. You, you right. can't afford to not have black voters out. You can't afford to have not have Asian voters out, Hispanic voters if they're there. All of those numbers count, because if you can build that solid enough coalition, mathematically, and again, Doc, you're a political scientist, you know this, Democrats have the advantage. It's the question, though, is can you pull all of those district right. groups together? If you can, you can win. You can still win. Michelle Goldberg and Michelle Michael Singleton, thank you so much for joining me.